one of the most critical questions in molecular biology is how do you figure out the cellular localization of a protein? Specifically, when certain properties are given to you, like for instance, you know, the molecular weight of the protein, a few specifics about the linear sequence of the protein at hand, like for instance, you have a few stretches of amino acids that correspond to specific sequences or specific regions with properties that are specific in terms of hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity. How do you use all of that information to figure out the potential cellular localization of a protein? That's a really critical question and it's one that I'm going to be addressing in this brief movie. So here we have nine different examples of different proteins. Each one of them with peculiarities that are associated to the linear amino acid sequences of those proteins. So what we have is information that indicates characteristics associated with the primary structure of these proteins. So all of these, all of these characteristics that are kind of summarized on this table, all of them are associated with the primary structure of the protein. That is their amino acid sequences. All right, so let's, let's start addressing the, the potential cellular localization of all of these proteins that are shown in this example by thinking about what are all the potential localizations of proteins in the cell. So proteins can be localized in different compartments within the cell. Um, essential idea number one is all proteins are synthesized in the cytoplasm. That is the, the place where protein synthesis takes place. So a newly synthesized protein will be located right there in the cytoplasm. But proteins, as they are being synthesized, they may end up being synthesized also in ribosomes that are associated to the membranes of, of the endoplasmic reticulum. So while the place for protein synthesis is the cytoplasm, some proteins, soon after they start being synthesized, they become associated to the membranes of the endoplasmic reticulum. So they could actually be also be synthesized in ER-associated ribosomes. So those two potential locations for protein synthesis are indicated right here. So one potential localization is free ribosomes. The other place where proteins may be synthesized is in ER bound ribosomes. The thing that dictates whether they are going to be synthesized in free floating ribosomes or in ribosomes that are associated to membranes of the endoplasmic reticulum is the presence of hydrophobic sequences that may actually drive the association of the protein that is being synthesized with the membranes of the endoplasmic reticulum. So those hydrophobic sequences are typically what we refer to as signal sequences. And I have addressed this particular topic in a previous video. So essential idea here, and very briefly, if you're synthesized in free floating ribosomes, you can actually be destined, targeted to any of these three different locations within the cell. You can either end up in the cytoplasm, so you may end up in here, or you may end up in the nucleoplasm inside the nucleus, or you may also be targeted to mitochondria or peroxisomes as well. So if you are synthesized in free floating ribosomes, those are the potential destinations that you can go in the cell. But if you are synthesized in ribosomes that are associated to the membranes of the ER, the potential locations where you may actually end up going are, include the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, endosomes or lysosomes, and the plasma membrane. Now, in these different locations, it is important to consider that depending upon the presence of sequences that will allow the protein to become integrated into membranes, the proteins may end up being either integral membrane proteins of the endoplasmic reticulum or soluble proteins free floating proteins in the endoplasmic reticulum, or they may also be integral membrane proteins of the Golgi or soluble proteins of the Golgi, or the same goes for lysosomes and endosomes. And at the plasma membrane, they may end up being associated to the plasma membrane as integral membrane proteins, or if they are soluble and they go to the plasma membrane, then they will be secreted out of the cell. Those are the potential locations where proteins can be targeted. All right, so with that already clarified, let's go back to our list of initial proteins and let's figure out where each one of these proteins is going to be targeted. All right, so let's start with our first protein. So a quick scan of the first protein indicates that there are no specific sequence motifs on its primary sequence. Uh, so there are no cleol sequences, no hydrophobic sequences, 
Not specific amino acid sequences that could be playing a specific role in targeting the protein to specific cellular locations, uh, including no mitochondrial targeting sequences. So therefore, um, the one factor that is going to be critical for this protein is its molecular weight. So the fact that it doesn't have any particular targeting signals indicates that it could potentially be located where it is synthesized, the cytoplasm. That's the place where it is going to be synthesized. It probably is being synthesized in free floating ribosomes. And the absence of nuclear localization signal says that it could particularly remain in the cytoplasm. However, this protein is very small. It's below the 40 kilodalton limit that we indicated that was the size barrier to allow proteins to freely flow through the nuclear pore complex. So this protein is smaller than the 40 kD barrier, which means it could squeeze by itself. It could flow freely through the nuclear pore complex. Therefore, it could potentially get into the nucleus. So the most likely cellular location of this protein is equally distributed between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. Okay, second protein. There are a few specific motifs that are important to keep in mind. Um, so let's start with the first one, the hydrophobic sequence. This sequence is only seven amino acids in length. So this is not long enough to act as a signal sequence or to act as a transmembrane domain. So this is not long enough. And therefore we can ignore that sequence. It's a short hydrophobic sequence. So it has no relevance. All right, now the other thing that is important, the molecular weight of this protein that's larger than 40 kD. So therefore this protein could not be in the nucleus unless, unless it contains a nuclear localization signal. And scanning through the specific amino acid sequences that are indicated, this sequence KKRKR, that's five positive amino acids in a row. It's a classic um, nuclear localization signal. Now the second signal, that is shown there, LXXX, LXX, LXL, those leucines with that particular spacing are the typical spacing that characterizes the prototypical nuclear expert signal. So therefore, this protein could be targeted to the nucleus because of the presence of the nuclear localization signal, but once in the nucleus, it could be exported back out of the nucleus because it contains a nuclear expert signal. So therefore, this protein could also have nuclear and cytosolic localization. So it could shuttle across the nuclear pore complex as it has both a nuclear localization signal and a nuclear expert signal, potentially equally distributed between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. All right, now let's take a look at protein number three. And a quick scanning of protein number, number three indicates that there are three hydrophobic sequences on that protein. And it's a very large protein, it's 100 kilodaltons in molecular weight. Um, and it also contains the KDL motif at the carboxy terminus. Now, the hydrophobic sequences that it contains are long hydrophobic sequences. Each one of them is 20 amino acids long or longer. Now, those sequences, since they are at least 20 hydrophobic amino acids in length, they could potentially be transmembrane domains. That is, they are long enough to span the membranes of the cell. So those could be acting as transmembrane domains. So it will be um, very likely that this protein will be anchored in a membrane. So it will actually go across the membrane and it has three potential transmembrane domains. So one, two, and three transmembrane domains. Um, the first one could actually act both as a signal sequence as well as a transmembrane domain. So this protein is very likely to be associated to membranes. It's an integral membrane protein. Now the question is, where will it be located? So it will be destined to a circuitry pathway, but will it be in the ER, the Golgi, or the plasma membrane? Well, this sequence that it contains near at the carboxy terminus, that sequence will be a retrieval sequence, but that's, that's the retrieval sequence for soluble proteins, not for membrane associated proteins. So therefore, this protein does not contain any retrieval sequence that will keep it in the endoplasmic reticulum. And it's very likely to progress through the secretory pathway all the way to the plasma membrane. So it's very likely to be an integral membrane protein of the plasma membrane. That's protein number three. All right, moving along, protein number four. Again, quick scanning of the protein. It contains 
one amino acid sequence that is the the losing rich sequence motif with the perfect spacing to act as a nuclear expert signal. We had already talked about that specific sequence. We had mentioned that the protein number two also contained that same sequence that we have here in protein number four. So that's, that's a nuclear expert signal. But what would be the relevance of that? Well, this protein is really small. It's 20 kilodaltons in molecular weight, which means it could be able to freely move through the nuclear pore complex because it's smaller than 40 kilodaltons. So it could potentially go to the nucleus, but the fact that it contains a nuclear expert signal implies that the fraction of the protein that will be able to get inside the nucleus will be probably very rapidly exported out of the nucleus. So therefore, protein number four is likely to be mostly concentrated in the cytoplasm, but it may actually have a small fraction in the nucleus as well. So mostly cytosolic, but with a small component in the nucleus. That's protein number four. Moving along, protein number five. Protein number five contains a hydrophobic amino acid sequence ne near the end terminus, and it's a cleavable sequence. So that hydrophobic sequence can be cleave. Those are the typical features of the signal sequence. So this is a, a cleavable signal sequence. So it's the type of protein that will be targeted to endoplasmic reticulum. And once it translocates into endoplasmic reticulum, it probably will be a free floating protein, a soluble protein inside the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, the sequence that it contains toward the carboxyl terminus is the kind of signal that acts as a retrieval sequence, but it's a retrieval sequence for integral membrane proteins, not for soluble proteins. So therefore, this signal will not be able to keep the protein or retrieve the protein to the ER. So therefore, this protein is very likely to be secreted. So protein number five will be probably secreted out of the cell. All right, moving along, protein number six. Again, quick scanning, one hydrophobic sequence, one sequence motif toward the C terminus, and a molecular weight of 85 kilodaltons. Now, this sequence, 25 hydrophobic amino acid residues just in the middle of the protein, that is long enough to act as a transmembrane domain but it, since it, there are no other hydrophobic sequences anywhere in the protein, that particular sequence is also going to act as not only as a transmembrane domain, but also as a signal sequence. So therefore, this protein is going to be targeted to a circuitry pathway, it's going to be synthesized in ribosomes that are associated to the membranes of the endoplasmic reticulum. And now this other motif that is right at the carboxyl end of this protein, that is the kind of sequence that for integral membrane proteins can act as a retrieval sequence for the ER. So this protein is likely to be an integral membrane protein of the endoplasmic reticulum because it contains a sequence that will allow it, allow it to be retrieved back to endoplasmic reticulum. Moving along, protein number seven. Now, quick scanning again. It contains a hydrophobic sequence with a cleavable signal that is located near the end terminus. And then it contains two additional amino acid sequences, one that is rich in positively charged amino acids. And then it also contains the KDL sequence motif at the C terminus. And this protein is only 42 kilodaltons in molecular weight. All right, so the first thing is the presence of that hydrophobic sequence near the end terminus. That's the typical sequence, again, that will act as a cleavable signal sequence. Let's just copy paste this so that we save time. All right, so it's a clear signal sequence, and therefore this protein will be targeted to a circuitry pathway. The fact that it is targeted to a circuitry pathway now basically abolishes any potential function that that positively charged amino acid sequence could actually play because that's that sequence, that positively charged amino acid sequence, that will be a nuclear localization signal. But since this protein is already being targeted to a circuitry pathway, then this protein will not even be in the cellular localization that will allow it to go as a soluble protein into a nucleoplasm. So therefore, that sequence doesn't play a role. But on the other hand, it does contain the KDEL sequence toward the C terminus. And that sequence is the typical sequence that acts as a retrieval sequence for soluble proteins. So this protein is very likely to be a soluble protein of the endoplasmic reticulum. 
So protein number seven is likely to be a free floating protein, a soluble protein, one that is not membrane associated and is likely to be retrieved back into the endoplasmic reticulum because it contains the retrieval sequence KDEL and therefore it will reside in the endoplasmic reticulum as a soluble protein. All right, moving along, protein number eight. This protein is different from all the other proteins that we have dealt with up to now. It actually contains a mitochondrial targeting sequence. These sequences, they are characterized by having positively charged amino acids with a different spacing than your typical nuclear localization signals. So, and it's actually a longer sequence, what is required for mitochondrial targeting. So it doesn't really matter. The important thing is that this sequence will target the protein to the mitochondria. Uh, now, in addition to that, it also contains a potential nuclear localization signal, a hydrophobic patch that is only nine amino acids in length, and this protein is 58 kilodaltons in molecular weight. Now, the predominant feature of this protein, the sequence that will basically drive the cellular localization of this protein, is the mitochondrial targeting sequence. So this protein is going to be targeted to the mitochondria. And that sequence is going to override any other signal that is present in this protein. Okay, and with that we get to our final protein, protein number nine. In this case, a quick scanning of the protein shows the presence of a typical nuclear localization signal toward the entrance of the, of the protein, but then it also contains a fairly long hydrophobic sequence at the carboxyl terminus of the protein. This protein has a molecular weight of 71 kilodaltons. Now, the thing about this protein is it could potentially go to the, nuclear, to the nucleus because it contains a nuclear localization signal, but the protein will not be able to be targeted to any location within the cell until it is fully synthesized. And the moment that it gets fully synthesized, then it will ex expose that hydrophobic sequence that is located at the very C terminus of the protein. And that type of hydrophobic sequence being that long, that's the kind of sequence that will be recognized by the GET3 protein, which will target this protein to the GET1, GET2, ER associated protein complex that will allow the protein to then translocate through the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum and become an integral membrane protein of the endoplasmic reticulum that is facing the luminal side. So this internal part of the protein will be facing the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, since there are no other sequences that will allow the protein to be retained at the endoplasmic reticulum, once it is translocated into the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum, this protein will move along the secretory pathway and will end up at the plasma membrane. So this protein will be another integral membrane protein of the plasma membrane. All right, and with that, we have finished all the examples that I had for you in terms of proteins that have specific sequences that could destine them to different locations within the cell. I hope that this will give you a sense of how to approach these kind of questions, which are frequent questions that are important to address in order to understand the functionality of proteins inside the cell. I hope that you enjoyed this video and if you did, as always, give it thumbs up and subscribe to my YouTube channel.